So, uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to talk today about something called finite state transducers. And in particular, they're what we call minimal deterministic acyclic finite state transducers. And I'll be honest, I, I'll, that, that sounds intimidating. I know when I first started getting into the literature, seeing a title like that would have made me just want to leave the room. So, uh, and, and it really is backed by the kind of crazy math that you see on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, but the good news is we're not going to go into that today. This is going to be much more high level. And we're going to start with things I think you guys already know. We're going to build up to finite state transducers. So let's start with a finite state machine. This is sort of a very classic Wikipedia example. You've got an old school turnstile. Uh, there's two states, locked and unlocked. The state starts in this locked state. You insert a coin, you're going to transition to the unlocked state. You can keep putting more coins in if you want, but it doesn't matter. You're still going to stay in that unlocked state until you finally push it and return back to the start point, the locked state. Nothing, nothing really new here. So now we're going to talk about finite state automata. And the first thing to realize is finite state automata is a finite state machine. It's just another word for the same thing. But I wanted to introduce that word because you're going to see that in the literature if you get into this uh, type of stuff. So the other difference that what we're looking at now is the transitions are made by bytes that are coming in as input. So we can start thinking of these as accepting or matching a particular input. The one we see here is going to match the strings cat, cats, and dog. And I should mention the final states are the ones with two circles that you see with uh, six and three. Now this looks probably like something else you've worked with before, a regular expression. It's very common to think about a regular expression that matches the same set of strings. Like the one I have here will also match cat, cats, and dog. And that's not an accident. It turns out the theory behind it is such that regular expressions and finite state automata are equivalent, right? And we also naturally think about regular expressions. We think about them, we say, they match this particular set of strings. With regular expressions, that's sometimes an infinite set of strings. But that notion that it represents a set is the one we're going to build on it. So now we're going to look at these FSAs, finite state automatas, which we call FSAs, as implementing a set, and not just any set, an ordered set. So we can answer the questions, does it contain a particular key? But also we can enumerate ranges of keys by simply following the traversals on the graph in a particular order. Now in the beginning I mentioned finite state transducer, so we're still not all the way there yet. What's missing? Well, the first thing we're going to notice is now the, the transitions in the graph don't just have a byte on the input, but also have a particular value that they produce as an output. And as we traverse the graph, you're going to encounter multiple values. So we have to have some sort of way of collecting multiple values. We're going to do that with a function. In our case, we're going to stick to the sum function. So if we follow these transitions, in the case of t, there's no value, so that's just like there's a zero. We can see that the, the, the key of cat is now associated with the value nine. And so just like the FSA was an ordered set, that means now the finite state transducer allows us to implement an ordered map. So just like before, we can ask, does it contain a particular key? But we can also ask, what is the value associated with the key? And just like before, we could enumerate ranges of keys, we can now enumerate ranges of key value pairs. And again, they're all going to be coming back in a lexicographic order. So what I want to talk more about in detail today is we build a library called Vellum which implements FSTs in Go. This particular implementation has two very distinct phases. There's a build phase, and then there's a separate using phase. In the build phase, we're going to have to insert the keys in lexicographic order. Now, that sounds like a burden when you first hear it. Like, oh, i got to already have my data sorted in order to work with it. But there come with, comes with that a number of payoffs as well. The main one is that we can do this with bounded memory use. So we can build an FST over millions of keys, but be using a constant amount of memory the entire time we're doing the building. And the other one I want to highlight is that we're able to stream the output while we're building. That's a really important property because it means we're not building up some gigantic structure in memory and then when we're done serializing it all out. We can actually be doing a little bit of disk I.O. as we do the building. That's going to help us make better utilization of the whole machine, both the disk and the CPU resources. Now when we're done the building, the, the FST is implemented as a, it serializes basically a stream of bytes. When we then go to use it, there are a couple other properties. So obviously, if we have separate build and use phases, that means this is immutable. Once we've built this thing, we can't just add one more key if we want, right? So that's, again, sort of a negative. But again, there's, there's some, some positives that come with this. First is, this FST data, this like byte string that we built in the first phase, 
we don't have to read the whole thing in to use it. Right? We can use the memory map system call that allows us to work with very large files. So you could have a 100 gigabyte FST serialized out, and you can work with that even if your machine has 16 gigs of RAM. It might be paging things in and out, it might be unacceptably slow, but it will keep working. And the final point is that because we're working with this byte slice, all the references, right? When you see this chart, the graphs we saw before, you know you're going to have states and transitions. You would expect there to be a lot of pointers connecting things around. But because this is a byte slice, all of our pointers are just integer offsets. And the fact that those aren't pointers means now we're going to be much more friendly for the garbage collector because we don't have this huge burden of all these pointers used by this library. So let's dive in and see how we would construct an FST. What we're going to construct is going to have three key value pairs, string one, and the number one, two, two, three, three. So to get started, the first thing we're going to do is with the volume libraries, we're going to call the new method. This takes uh, two, two arguments. The first one, I've named it F because it's frequently a file, but it can be any I.O. writer. And the second argument is for some advanced options. We can just pass in nil and get the default behavior. Now we're going to go ahead and insert the first entry. Now, it's worth pointing out here, I'm, I'm converting this to a slice of bytes, because the FST we're building is what we call a byte FST. What that means is all the transitions inside of this FST are based on seeing a particular byte. And I know some of you in the audience are already thinking, oh great, that means I can't do anything with uh, Unicode strings. But we can. And I'm going to ask you to sort of suspend your disbelief. We will have a slide where we talk about that later in the day. <coughs> So now when we insert this first key, again, we initially have nothing in memory, so we're going to build a memory structure corresponding to what you see here. I tried to improve it for the display, but I still see I got some of the letters cut off. So it's the letters O, N, and E on the transitions. And we're going to put the value on the leftmost or closest to the root of this graph here. That has the value 1. Not very interesting because that's the only thing in, in it so far. But next we're going to insert 3. Now, Again, it's important to note it's 3 coming before 2 because of the H is before W when we're inserting these in order. So that's not an accident. That's the reason we're inserting these in this particular order. The first step is we have to figure out where does the key we're inserting diverge from the data structure we've already built. Well, in this case, the first letter is T. And we see that that's going to branch right off of the root. So the entire thing we're adding is going to branch off starting at the, the node 0. And we see that, again, one transition for each of those new letters. But an important thing has happened as well, and that's that if we take a look at it, I've color-coded some of these blue, the, the states 1, 2, and 3. And we refer to these as frozen states now, because a side effect of us inserting these in order is that we now know that no future insertions would ever change states 1, 2, and 3. It's impossible because we're inserting in order. Now, once they're frozen, there's generally a few more things we can do. But since this is the first set of frozen states, the only thing we can do at this point is go ahead and flush those out to disk or to the writer that we're working with. So again, we've only inserted two strings, but we've already made some progress serializing this thing out. Let's go ahead and insert the final string, two. Just like before, we're going to start by figuring out where does this new key diverge from the structure we already have. The first time it was at state zero, but we already had something with the key starting with the letter T. So now this one's going to branch off starting at state four. We see the new transitions for W and O are added. But there was another subtle change, and I'll go back just to show you. On the last slide, the transition from 0 to 4 had the value of 3 associated with it. Now that's been decremented to 2. And the reason is we still need these sums to add up correctly to the, the correct values. So if you see, by reducing that one to 2 and pushing the one additional 1 down to the H transition, we still get the correct value for 3 by summing those values. And we now also get the correct value for 2 that we're inserting. There are a few more wrinkles to that logic, but for the purposes of this talk, that's, that's sufficient. Now, just like before, once we've inserted TWO, we now see that states 5, 6, 7, 8 are also frozen. But there's an additional step we can take. Before we serialize those out, we can say, is there, are there other states that already exist and serve the exact same function? And if we look, state 8 is actually identical to state 3. They're both final states with no transitions. So we can go ahead and replace state 8 with state 3. And we can repeat the process by looking at state 7. And I didn't realize that's actually the same as state 2. It's not a final state. And it has a single transition on the input character E, which goes to state 3. So we can replace that as well. Now, if you look at states 5 and 6, there's nothing else to do any replacements. So we can go ahead and serialize those out as well. Now, we've already inserted the last key, which was 2. But because it's a builder, we need to do one final step 
and that's the call close. Now when we call close, again, we know that no further mutations are going to happen, so states 0, 4, 9, and 10 are frozen. And we can replace 10 with 3, just like before. States 0, 4, and 9, those are all unique, and we can't do any replacements. So we'll flush those out. And so at this point, that writer that we passed into that new method, it now has, inside of it, it's been written out a complete serialization of this FST. So we're ready to go on and use this. If you'd serialize it up to a file, you can use the vellum open method and pass in that path. If you do that, that has the advantage we're going to memory map the file and not read the whole thing into memory. But I mentioned earlier, you didn't have to write to a file. You could have been doing all of this in memory. And so I mentioned fine text at the bottom there. There's also a load method if you have like a byte slice in memory representing the FST. Once it's open, you can use the get method. It's very straightforward. It returns the value. It returns a Boolean if it exists or not, and possibly an error as well. So ranges I talked about, we can use a fairly standard iterator pattern. We give it a start and an end point, and we keep calling, keep moving through the iterator calling next, and the current key and value are returned with the current method. But the real power comes when we look at this method. If you remember back in the beginning, I told you that the finite, uh, the regular expressions are actually a finite state automata. And if you, now that you've seen the FSTs, we're really just a finite state automata with an additional value associated with it. So we can leverage that property. It's actually very efficient to combine two FSTs and say, which of these two over, which of these things overlap between these two things? And that, what that means is we can now search through our FST by providing another automaton as an input. So here's an example of that. Vellum has a regular expression package. In this case, I call new on that package and, that, and give it the regular expression C dot star T. That's going to build a finite automata for the regular expression, which matches things starting with C and ending with T. And now when we pass that in as the first argument to the search method, we can iterate through all the keys that match that particular regular expression. But we're not limited just to regular expressions. We can do fuzzy matching. Uh, there's a concept called a Levenstein edit distance, where we can say, given two strings, how different are they? The example I give here, I have the string cat, and we're going to use an edit distance of one. So that edit distance refers to the number of additions, removals, and substitutions that we need to make to get the two strings to match. So for example here, at, bat, and cat would all match the string cat with an edit distance of one. We can build finite automata for this Levenstein edit distance and pass it in as that first argument to search, just like we did with the regular expressions. Now, I told you earlier, what about, what about Unicode data? Uh, this is sort of a, a problem you're going to be thinking about right away. So, here I have cafe, both with the accent mark and without. And us as human beings, we look at it and we think, well, that should have an edit distance of one. I'm just substituting one character for the other. But we know inside the FST, it's looking at the bytes. And if you do work to do it, if you use a byte as the unit of substitution, or, or edit, adding or removing, the edit distance would be two. And so this clearly is going to give us the wrong behavior, right? We don't want this to have an edit distance of two. We want it to have an edit distance of one. And the way it works is, and this is taking, uh, borrowing on some of the work from uh, Russ Cox and his regular expression implementations, we can actually do the UTF-8 decoding in the finite state automata that we built. So both our regular expression and our Levenstein automata handle UTF-8 decoding inside of their, the state machine. So the good news is, if you're using UTF-8, this works. And you could, of course, build other ones if you need to work with other encodings of the data as well. I want to give you a few concrete examples. So let's start with the system dictionary. On my laptop, that had 235,000 words. I had plain text, that was about 2.5 megs. When I built the FST for that data, it's about 1.2 megs. So it's about just under 50% in terms of the original size. Now, I wanted to point out GZIP uh, gets it down to about 30% of the original size. Now, it's important to note we're not competing on compression ratio here, right? It's, it's a nice property that we're also able to compress the data, but we're building an advanced data structure with a lot of other nice properties to it. Uh, so this is really just a data point to get a sense of how, how much did it compress the data. Well, let's take a look at an example. I mentioned being able to do regular expression searches, so let's go ahead and run one. Vellum ships, it's a library, but it ships with a command line tool. So I can run vellum grep words.fst and then pass in the regular expression C dot star T. And that's going to stream through and list out all words that start with C and end with T in the dictionary. 
And we can do the same with fuzzy searching as well. Same command, Gollum. This time it's going to be fuzzy. Words.fst. And we use the string cats, C A T S. And that matches bats, mats, cat, and so on. Now, I also wanted to highlight the memory usage. I, I made a very important point earlier about how we're using bounded memory use throughout the entire operation. So this is a, is a, is a, a load I did of uh, indexing Wikipedia articles. Uh, this is a rather old data dump, so it's 6.7 million titles. I think it's closer to 13 million if you were to look at a more recent dump. But it still works for our purposes. Uh, I've got the next bar I'm on uh, showing you the memory usage here. And you notice the heap in use max was 6.1 megs while we loaded all 6 million of these entries. Uh, and again, this was about 95% done at the time we took that measurement. Now, I want to give a little bit of talk about some of the future work. Uh, why am I even interested in this data structure? Well, I work on a full text library called Lovey, uh, and full text libraries have something they call a term dictionary. And it turns out the FST is a really good data structure for working with these term dictionaries. Uh, so we have a new term dictionary format that we're looking at, which we expect will be based very heavily on this Vellum FST. The second thing is, uh, we right now you notice we just mapped, uh, the keys were bytes, but we mapped them just to integers. That's, that's nice, but it's not particularly useful. Right? You often want to store something more than just an integer with it. Uh, so we'd like to extend this to be able to support another slice of bytes. So at that point, it's almost like a key value store in terms of the capabilities. And of course, there's the continued optimizations. I mentioned we have bounded memory use, but we still have more garbage being created than we really need. So that's an area where we have some more work to do. And I wanted to plant one little seed for thought. Uh, the first point is, this is not a general purpose data structure. If you have small or medium lists of strings, this probably isn't the right one for you. Hash map, vtree, try, all of those may work better for your use case. The, the rule is, as always, you need to benchmark it yourself and see. But instead, I want you to think about this as sort of a different kind of map. We're used to things like hash maps, where given an exact key, we can get the exact value back. And we're used to things like vtrees, where maybe if I know a prefix, I can gain some optimization and, and do things. But the unique aspect of this is, now what we're saying is efficient access is driven by us being able to have any finite automaton which describes the key or keys we're interested in. We've provided two with the regular expression in fuzzy, but I think that's an area where there'll be new applications of this library by people coming up with different automatons that work with their unique keys. Uh, I think that's where it's sort of an interesting uh, development for sort of future. Uh, and with that, I really want to call out Andrew Gallant's blog, Index 1.6 Billion Keys with Automata and Rust. Uh, if it was not for that blog post, uh, the Bone Library wouldn't exist, and I wouldn't be here talking about it today. And if you are inclined to read the, the mathematical uh, mess that I showed you earlier there, the paper you want to start with is Direct Construction of Minimal Acyclic Subsequential Transducers. Uh, it's even, even a mouthful for me to say uh, on stage. Uh, with that, I thank you all for your time. And we have time, so I can take questions. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the question was, did we do any comparison with the Go and Rust libraries? Uh, we have, uh, I would say that from my perspective, the first step, because this is still a new library, is correctness. Uh, so we do have a test where we're uh, able to uh, use their command line tool and our command line tool on the same sets of data and verify that we get the exact same binary FST. Because our first goal, well, our long-term goal isn't absolute compatibility with their format. Uh, it was a good measurement that we're, are we doing this right? Uh, so that's one thing we've done. In terms of performance, uh, we're not as fast as them. I would say part of that right now probably is still due to the fact that we're creating garbage. Uh, and, and we're not doing anything yet to really try and minimize our garbage. Uh, whereas with Rust, obviously, the, the memory management is much more explicit. Uh, so that's, I mean, we're in the ballpark. When I first started out, it was like the orders of magnitude different. But now we're sort of like competitive, but slower. Uh, so that's an area where we're still working on that part. So. Another question in the back there? So was Lucene added on years ago, right? Yes, so Lucene has, it's basically they came to the same conclusion years ago. Uh, they've started using uh, finite state transducers. Uh, they work well for, like I said, regular expression, fuzzy matching, prefix searches. All of those are things where you generally start out with the term dictionary and doing those operations. Uh, so the FST works really well for that. Uh, not yet, but we haven't switched to it yet, so I think we're still in the process of uh, evaluating using an FST for the term dictionary. Yeah. Up here, friend. So you made a reference to the Unicode part, and I missed it. 
there is this general principle bound to uh, text-based representations uh, in any sort of fundamental way, or is that just the way it's implemented? Because what I describe with random data structure as my nodes and to do some operation across nodes to extract Sure. Uh, so the question was, do we, uh, is, it, is it sort of rooted in text in any critical way, or can we use any sort of representation? Uh, that was one of the reasons we chose to use the byte as the underlying input, right? So the fact that some of the things you might want to do with it uh, would be using like a UTF-8 decoder, that's not required, right? So any sequence of bytes is a valid input as a key here. Uh, and eventually, if we do the extension I was talking about, any sequence of bytes would be a suitable value. Um, now, where it has to make sense is uh, the traversals you want to do, you, have, you obviously have to be aware of what encoding you're putting in there, right? So if you said, I have some geodata, and I, can, I have a really interesting encoding of it, and it's just these sequence of bytes, right? It's not valid UTF-8. That would be fine. You could insert that in there. But the real question would be, okay, now, in terms of your access patterns, could you build a finite automaton that can match the ones you want in, a, in an interesting way? And I think that's where, that's why I said I think there's room for new things going on in the future uh, with the same data structure. Let's go ahead. Okay. Oh, one, one, more. one more question. One more. Yeah. Um, in your example, you were using sub as your aggregation function. Do you support other? other uh, we don't support any others right now. There is a particular algebra that needs to be satisfied by what, by what the value is and what that function is. Some is the most obvious one to use, uh, but others. We could change it to, like, if, if people have others they're interested in, we could certainly look at adding those. I think that one uh, should be pretty much a little bit. Thank you. All right, thank you.